Okay, so welcome back. Uh, our fourth and final talk for the day will be by uh, Tony Pantev. This will be the third lecture as part of his mini course. All right, uh, so um, so we discussed the the geometry. Uh, that will give us uh, our eigenvalue problem. Um, so we had this Hecke correspondence relating two copies of the moduli space and the curve. And uh, We wanted to find um, a parabolic line bundle on H with its parabolic divisor such that um, uh, it, it corresponds to a twist or D module, so, so the parabolic chunk class is zero. And uh, such that um, for every Higgs field uh, with new potent residues, we get um, we can produce another Higgs field on the surface X so that the Hecke condition holds. Now, um, yes, so everything is with new potent residues. So that was my setup that, that, that guaranteed that the twists were chosen in, correct, in the correct way so that everything will be with new potent residues on this side. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, so now we need to, to construct this guy uh, and prove that this equation is solvable. I mean, in that whatever our construction is solves this equation. Um, <clears throat> notice that that um, there is a part of this problem which is purely numerical linear algebra, uh, uh, but it's it's kind of mysterious. So. Um, uh, uh, so, in particular, we need a map. We need to be able to specify the parabolic weights for F and Phi. So the input of the data are the parabolic weights for uh, the parabolic bundle on P1. And suddenly we have to specify parabolic weights for a parabolic bundle on a surface. And uh, um, so first of all, I didn't tell you, uh, uh, and it's not obvious from what I'm saying, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's true, and we'll, I'll explain it in a moment. Uh, so, so a side remark here is that um, F dot will have rank 4. So this, this eigen D module that you get will be of rank 4 uh, and will have 
two-step parabolic structure. Parabolic filtration on each Li. So we started with a situation in which uh, we had five points and we had a two-step parabolic structure at each of the five points on something of rank two. So there are two weights that you can specify at each of the five points. And we are supposed to produce something of rank four, but never mind that what it is. I mean, you know, it's some complicated object, but at least there is some numerology for us that we need to de 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 determine, which is it has to have a pair of parabolic weights specified for each point, uh, for each line. So there is a map, uh, so we need I mean, if we can solve this problem, we need to eventually produce a map. And in fact, it has to be a linear map from the space of parabolic weights on P1 to the space of parabolic weights on the surface. So it's going to go from, uh, well, who okay, well, Let me say R to the fifth cross r to the fifth to uh, r to the sixteenth cross r to the sixteenth. Right. There are two for each point and there are two for each line. So you, you have seen, so this, this is what's called the Aomoto map uh, in the case of four points. So on the, uh, in the world of D modules, this is the, the map that tells you when you start with the four residues of uh, the eigenvalue uh, on P1 with four points, in this case there are five residues, right? How do you convert those into the twistings of the D module? What is the actual twisting? And uh, so in the case of four points, this is the Omoto map. It's some specific matrix with integral coefficients. I don't know if you saw it last week or if you didn't, but it's, it's some well-known matrix. But it's a four by four matrix in the case of P1 with four points, just because the moduli space is again P1 with four points. Maybe, you know, you have to double them to, to, to get the, uh, the, the residues correctly, but but, you know, the, the, the twistings are one twisting and minus that twisting on the other point. So it's really a 4 by 4 matrix. In this case, it's, well, 10 by 32. So, so there is some mysterious matrix with, with integral or rational coefficients that, that you have to find eventually. Uh, and uh, so, so, I mean, we, we did find it. It's complicated. Uh, it's just coming out from the solution, the fact that there is a solution. And apparently, there is absolutely no number theoretic reason of, uh, 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 for this matrix. And so I, I talked to a bunch of number theorists, and they, they are all fascinated by the fact that we can actually find this matrix. Um, and uh, they all want to know uh, uh, what, what are these matrices in general. And there should be a general formula. Uh, I don't know what the general formula is. Here we just you know, solve the problem so we know what it is. Um, uh, but there is no discernible pattern in, in the solution, so I can't, can't tell um, but, uh, whether this, this formula generalizes in any obvious way. But, but yeah, I just wanted to, to, to make this remark that, uh, 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 that uh, solving this problem already has a non-trivial numerical part, which is to find that map. Uh, and one should be able, from first principles, to, 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 to solve that numerical part, not, not actually find the eigenshift, but just, just do it. And uh, uh, um, I don't know how to do that without actually finding the eigenshift. <clears throat> okay, let me now go to the, uh, <clears throat> to the construction. Um, <clears throat> so the idea of this construction uh, of uh, 
uh, construction of this and uh, f dot phi is to abelianize everything. So, <clears throat> what we're going to do, since we're dealing with Higgs bundles, we know how to convert the Higgs bundles to abelian objects, to rank one objects, by passing to spectral covers. So, with the eigenvalue, there is not a big mystery, right? This is a parabolic Higgs bundle on a curve. We know how to write a parabolic Higgs bundle on a curve as a push forward of a line bundle on a spectral cover. Well, there is a little subtlety here, which I'll explain in a moment, but, but it's not, not too far away. Uh, so we know how to abelianize E dot theta. We'll have to do the same thing with F dot phi. So we'll have to write F dot phi as the push forward of something living on a spectral cover. So that spectral cover, which is the spectral cover of the moduli space, is what is in my title, is the modular spectral cover. And then we'll need to also write the object that, that you get here in the Hecke transform, this guy, also in terms of spectral data. This is some Higgs bundle on the Hecke correspondence. So there will be some spectral cover of the Hecke correspondence which, on which the spectral data for this guy lives. And once you write all those guys together, everything will become a statement about abelian varieties that you can actually check. <clears throat> so that's the strategy. Let me now get into the details. Um, so the... So the, the, the first thing will be to abelianize E dot theta. <clears throat> the abelianization of E dot theta uh, is the usual spectral construction. Uh, the only problem is that in this case we're dealing with a slightly awkward symplectic leaf in the moduli of Higgs bundles. So uh, E dot theta is a point in a moduli space, I'm going to call it Higgs sub zero. So this is the moduli of stable, tame, parabolic Higgs guys uh, on C with the five points with neopotent residues. So this is the closure of the regular neopotent leaf. Um, the, um, uh, the slightly awkward thing I was, uh, I was mentioning is the fact that, um, so this, this guy is actually good and bad in, in some sense. Um, it's good in the sense that, um, um, so, so this thing is, is four-dimensional. So twice the dimension of x, as you expect. Uh, this is the guy that contains the neopotent cone. Right? This is the only symplectic leaf, the only closure of a of a symplectic leaf that contains the neopotent cone. Uh, all the others are actually closed and do not contain the neopotent cone. Um, the interesting thing about this guy is um, that um, so, so the kitchen map, so there is a kitchen map
uh, well, there is a Hitchin map on the whole modular space of Higgs bundles without constraining the residues, uh, uh, but you can restrict it to this guy. So the Hitchin map uh, goes, where does it go? Uh, theta is a section in, uh, um, uh, in it's a map from E to E tensor 1 forms on P1 with logarithmic poles at 5 points. So the Hitchin map is just taking the invariant polynomials of theta. In this case, there is only one invariant polynomial, which is the determinant, because theta is supposed to be traceless. We are doing SL2. Um, uh, so the determinant of theta uh, is going to be a section in uh, omega 1 on P1 with logarithmic poles at five points, which is really O of three. So the determinant of theta is a section in O of six. But there are conditions. There are five conditions on theta that the eigenvalues of the residue at the five points are zero. So this section of O of six actually vanishes at the five points. So where the Hitchin map sends us, it sends us that in, in uh, I'm going to say global sections on C with coefficients in KC log PC squared. That's where the Hitchin map normally goes. And from the whole modular space of Higgs bundles, it will go subjectively onto this. But we fix the Casimirs, so we fix the subspace in here. So the image. Uh, 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 the image is all sections vanishing at the five points. So, uh, so I'm going to call this guy B. Zero. So these are all sections in all six vanishing at six points. So this is really of one. So B0 is isomorphic to, in fact, naturally isomorphic to, sections in O of 1. So it's a two-dimensional vector space. <coughs> the fibers of H going from Higgs 0 to B0 are are uh, uh, connected, and they are <clears throat> Jacobians of spectral curves. Well, they're, you know, literally they're prim, but the base curve is P1, so the prim is actually a Jacobian. So the fibers are Jacobians of spectral curves. So the spectral curve, so if E theta is a point in Higgs zero, or then the fiber through this point is um, uh, the Picard of the spectral curve C twiddle, where C twiddle is given by the usual equation, the determinant of theta minus lambda times the identity equals to zero, where lambda is the tautological section on the total space of KC log PC. But again, because of our condition, this curve, so it's a, it's a, it's a curve which is a double cover of the base sitting inside this line bundle. Uh, uh, because of our condition, this curve actually intersects the zero section at the five points that we have marked. Uh, and in fact, I mean, you know, if you, if you compute your degrees correctly, uh, 
it, it really lives in pig tree. Uh, which is not a big deal because we have an odd, odd number mark points on this curve, so you can identify pick three with pick zero. So you can identify this with the Jacobian of C Twiddle, which is pick zero. You have to, to make sure, so I mean, there is a natural isomorphism here, you have to choose it. Let me just say what the isomorphism is. Um, <clears throat> um, the, the, so, so the point is that this curve C twiddle, we have the five points here. And uh, remember, the determinant of theta, which is really the equation of this spectral curve, vanishes at the six point. So let me call it P6. So that's the, you know, if you identify B0 with the section C0 of 1, it's just the point where this section vanishes. So there is just one choice, one extra choice that fixes a Hitchin fiber, and that's the choice of the point P6. And then this curve, C twiddle, uh, so I don't know how to write it, like how to draw it, but this curve C twiddle is a double cover of C branched at these six points, uh, 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 so it's a hyperelliptic curve of genus 2. But five of the six points are, are, are images of Weierstrass points of that hyperelliptic curve. So in C. Twiddle, we have six Weierstrass points. which I'm going to denote P1 Twiddle, P2 Twiddle, PC Twiddle, P3, P3 Twiddle, and P6 Twiddle. And they're really naturally broken into 5 and 1. Right? They're the 5 that were our parabolic points, and then there is the 6th one. So you can use this 6th one to identify any component of the Picard with the Jacobian. So that's what we're using here. So this is using P6 Twiddle. <sighs> okay, so there is a two-parameter family of spectral curves. The fiber is essentially the Jacobian. The Hitchin fiber is essentially the Jacobian. And uh, this fiber, so this, so I'm going to make now the non-degeneracy assumption that I always make. Uh, which makes things less interesting because it doesn't touch the neopotent cone or the singular fibers, uh, but you know allows you to actually do Fukemukai cleanly. Uh, so I'm going to make now this assumption, which is that C twiddle is smooth. So I'm only going to work with points, uh, uh, parabolic bundles, parabolic Higgs bundles whose spectral curve is smooth. So this is an open set in the module. I have Higgs bundles. Now, um, now what are we saying? We are saying that uh, C twiddle maps by a map pi two to one to C, and any line bundle of degree three on C twiddle pushes forward to a parabolic rank two vector bundle on C. Now, the, the, you know, the, the, this is a meaningless statement, right? Because a parabolic rank two vector bundle is a parabolic object. It's a whole family of bundles. And this is just a single line bundle that I'm choosing. So the way the spectral correspondence works for, for parabolic objects is that you actually have to put a parabolic structure on the spectral line bundle. You have a line bundle, you have the mark points sitting on top of that line bundle, and you need to choose a parabolic weight at each of those points. Um, so, <clears throat> so to convert 
uh, line bundle on C twiddle to E dot, we need uh, to choose a parabolic structure. On that line bundle. So this actually is an is a real choice bundle. Uh, at the five points, yeah. So this is a real choice. Uh, it has to happen at, at some points upstairs that map to the five points that we have. So if we were working with a general symplectic leaf, our spectral curve will still be of genus two. It still corresponds to a section in all of six. Uh, but the branch points will have nothing to do with the parabolic points. So that's the difference between this neopotent symplectic leaf and the general symplectic leaf. There will be just some other six tuple of points on, on C. And so the pre-image of the parabolic points inside the, the spectral curve will be two points, because the spectral curve is not going to be branched over the parabolic points. So to specify the parabolic structure downstairs, you need to say what your flock is, which means that out of these two points, you need to choose one, because you need to, pre you need to impose a, a parabolic structure on the line bundle at that point. And so that's why the fiber, so if you take a general symplectic leaf, the fiber of the Hitchin map is actually disconnected. It has 32 components for the two choices at each of the five points. Uh, but what happens is that, so if you look at the Hitchin map globally on the module of Higgs bundles, uh, the Hitchin map generically has a disconnected fiber. The disconnected fiber has 32 copies of the Jacobian of the spectral curve sitting there. But when you get to the zero symplectic lift, all those 32 guys actually collapsed into one. So the Stein factorization of the Hitchin map is a 32 sheeted cover of uh, of all of six, but it's actually completely branched over B0. So in that sense, this symplectic leaf is very special. And, <clears throat> and in particular, there is no need to make any choice of, uh, uh, of a parabolic structure here, because there is only one point over each of the five points. And that selects for you uh, uh, it's, it's a double point in the curve, but you are just prescribing a single parabolic divisor, so that selects for you, uh, in the, uh, in the push forward of a line bundle, it selects for you a line at each of those points. So, the parabolic, the quasi-parabolic structure is completely fixed by the line bundle. The only thing that you need to choose is the, uh, is the parabolic weight. Uh-huh. No, no, this is just for the residue being neopotent. No, Higgs zero for me is the whole leaf, is the, is the, is the closure of the regular neopotent leaf. No, no, neopotent residues. It's not globally neopotent. Yeah, so this guy, Higgs zero, maps to B zero. The fibers are Jacobians in general. There is the point zero in here. And the preimage of that is the neopotent cone. So these are the globally neopotent guys. But all the Higgs fields in this leaf have neopotent residues. Yeah. So uh, what did I want to say? So here is the subtlety. The subtlety is that normally when you're pushing forward the parabolic line bundle, of course you get a parabolic vector bundle. If nothing degenerate happens uh, at, um, at the parabolic divisor upstairs, right? If you have a parabolic divisor upstairs, if you have a finite cover, a parabolic divisor, and the parabolic divisor maps one-to-one -to, -one to a divisor downstairs, then there is no problem. You push down, you get a parabolic object. Here, the subtlety is that the... So, so this is a subtle issue which is that 
the pullback of the parabolic divisor on C is now reduced. It is twice P1 Twiddle plus twice P2 Twiddle plus twice P5 Twiddle. So if you really want to get your parabolic bundles downstairs, you're supposed to prescribe a parabolic structure on that non-reduced divisor. And um, I told you how to write down for a line bundle, a parab any parabolic line bundle, when the parabolic structure is prescribed on a reduced divisor. Uh, and so, so here you actually need to bootstrap this theory. You need to say what the theory looks like if you're dealing with parabolic line bundles, parabolic structures on normal crossing divisors, but the normal crossing divisors are allowed to have multiplicities. And uh, so, 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 the, uh, so, so maybe I, I, I'll make this as a comment. Parabolic structures on non-reduced divisors. And you get many more than the naive ones that you can get because you can take the multiplicity of the divisor and partition it any way you want. And so, uh, uh, so this will depend not only on the components, but also on a partition of the multiplicities of each component. So in order to talk about parabolic bundles with parabolic structure non reduced divisors, you first need to decorate each component of the divisor with a partition of the multiplicity. Once you've done that, once you've chosen a partition, then you can do what, what, what I was doing this morning. Uh, so let me just do it with one divisor. So if, uh, if, I have, uh, if I have a parabolic divisor on X, which is K times D, and say D is smooth, and I've partitioned K as K1 plus K2 plus Ks, then uh, a parabolic bundle on X with parabolic structure on Kd of type this partition uh, will be a family uh, which will have S different levels. So it will have fa uh, it will have levels A1, A2, AS, and you require the jump to happen in each part of the partition. With the conditions uh, on the jumps enforced. on each part. So in particular, a general parabolic line bundle uh, will be of the form A, uh, and then you have uh, what we had before. Uh, it will be, I don't know what I called it, uh, D1 uh, D plus D2 D plus DS D. And this at parts A1 AS is going to be the floor of D1 plus A1 
plus the floor of D2 plus A2 plus the floor of Ds plus As. The whole thing multiplying D. So it's exactly what we were doing this morning, but now you have more than one uh, uh, semi-continuous functions as coefficients. And so you have to do this with an appropriate partition. If you want to get your parabolic bundles correctly, you have to do it with an appropriate partition of this multiplicity too. So you can guess, I mean, you know, there is not much uh, freedom in partitioning two. So it's got to be either zero, two, or one, one. Um, you can try to guess, but in fact, you can actually study this problem scientifically from the general module of Higgs bundles, right? For the general symplectic leaf, there is no issue with the partition because the divisor is reduced. So you can take the parabolic line bundle on the general spectral curve and specialize it to this symplectic leaf. And when you do that, you see that you get the partition 1-1. One, one. So uh, the upshot of this discussion is that uh, we can write O E dot data guys as push forwards of <clears throat> of uh, a parabolic line bundle that looks like A uh, <clears throat> uh, with uh, one copy of the parabolic divisor on C Twiddle plus another copy of the parabolic divisor of C Twiddle. And these A and B are just vectors in R to the fifth. And the only condition you need to specify for this to work to give you the right symplectic leaf uh, uh, is the condition that the push forward has to have first parabolic chunk class zero. Uh, and that condition uh, says that, so if I normalize things so that the degree of A is zero, I want it to be in the Jacobian, uh, then the condition says that the sum of the AIs plus the BIs is three. So choose any 10 numbers with that property, and then vary the capital A that gives you the module space of parabolic bundles downstairs. Uh, and of course, uh, the, 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 the Higgs put is completely determined. It's the push forward of the tautological section on the logarithmic cotangent. So, uh, so, so that's it, uh, but it has two floors now. That's, uh, that's the subtlety. Um, so this abelianizes, uh, abelianizes E. So, so let me say it explicitly. So explicitly, uh, E E at a level T, so it will have five uh, uh, levels, level coefficients. This is going to be the push forward of a uh, uh, floor of A plus T plus floor of B plus T multiplying this parabolic divisor on C twiddle. And theta is going to be the push forward of tensorization of, with alpha, sorry, lambda, where lambda is the total logical section. On the total space of K log P3. So this describes this this uh, parabolic Higgs bundles completely in terms of, uh, of the spectral curve uh, and abelianizes the problem. Now, uh, you have to worry about stability. So not every push forward will be stable. So um, uh, 
the map from the Jacobian of the spectral curve to X, uh, which takes A and sends it to the push forward of A, blah, 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 uh, is rational. And uh, there are 16 points where it's not defined. which happen to be exactly the points of order 2 on the Jacobian. So you have to, if you want to resolve this map, you have to blow those points up. And it turns out that one blow up resolves the map. Uh, so blowing those up resolves the map. So I'm going to write y will be the blow-up of the Jacobian of the spectral curve at the 16 points of order 2. And then this morph map becomes a morphism and in fact becomes a finite morphism. I mean, the map is quasi-finite. It's just not proper. Uh, after the blow-up, we get a morphism, a finite morphism. I'm going to call it F from Y to X. In fact, it's finite of degree 4. Okay, so I didn't discuss what is the rank of the optomorphic D module of the, you know, the, 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 the smooth, you know, if you take the automorphic D module on its smooth part, it's just a flat bundle. What is the rank of that flat bundle? So that's actually something well known in the, in the Langland story. Uh, that rank is equal to the degree of this map. And this, this in complete generality for all groups, for all Hitchin fibers, it's just equal to the degree of this map. And this degree you can actually compute completely explicitly uh, because it's equal to the degree if you take a very stable bundle and take the fiber of uh, the cotangent bundle, this maps finitely onto the Hitchin base. But now it's a map between two vector spaces given by homogeneous polynomials. You know what the degrees of those polynomials are. You know, they're degree two on the quadratic part, degree three on the cubic part, and so on. You know the, the dimension, so you can just take the, the, the these degrees of powers and product. In this case, it just happens to be 4. Oh, no, because the, the map from the cotangent fiber to the kitchen base is only proper for the very stable. It's the same, it's the same you know, properness this way or that way. So uh, if, you want, if you want the map to be actually finite, to say what the degree is, you need, you need the very stable guys. But it's the same, the same count. Anyway, so this is a degree form map, finite degree form map. <clears throat> and now that's my modular spectral cup. Right, the Jacobian. <coughs> uh, um, so this maps to the Jacobian, which is the Hitchin fiber, which you can think of as this Lagrangian subvariety in the Hitchin moduli space. And you want to put a line bundle on top of this, and that would be uh, uh, the spectral data that would describe the automorphic Higgs bundle. Uh, the problem is that the map is not really proper because we're dealing with stable things, so you make proper by blowing up. Uh, you blow up 16 points, and then the map becomes proper and finite. Uh, so now you have to find the correct line bundle that would produce F. But we know what the correct line bundle is up to parabolic structures. Because uh, remember the, the, the procedure is that we need to conjugate by two non-abelian Koch correspondences the Fourier-Mukai transform. So here the map is going to be given, we have a point 
which corresponded to this bundle A in the Jacobian, so this is a point in the Jacobian, the Fourier Mukai of the skyscraper sheath at that point is going to be a degree zero line bundle on the Jacobian. And you can take this degree zero line bundle and pull it back to the blob. So you already have a candidate for the line bundle that would give you the F. Uh, you just need to put a parabolic structure on it. And that parabolic structure has to live on the divisors that are the pre-image of the parabolic divisors upstairs, uh, downstairs. Uh, so um, the abelianization of F dot phi will be a parabolic line bundle on Y with parabolic structure on the pre-image of the parabolic divisor, the wobbly divisor on X. So you need to understand that. And uh, <clears throat> it's not hard. So what happens is that uh, so there are the points of order two, the points in uh, uh, the two torsion points on the Jacobian, because this is a hyperelliptic curve, uh, they are also naturally labeled by the, set, the, the subsets of odd cardinality in 1 through 5. You can either label them by subsets of uh, even cardinality in 1 through 6 module complementation or odd cardinality in 1 to 5, or even cardinality in 1 to 5. Uh, but the point is that uh, the exceptional divisors for the blob are labeled by the same set. And it turns out that F upper star of Li is, so in fact, it turns out that this map, F from Y to X, is branched over each line. Ei is the ramification divisor, so the preimage of Li is twice Ei. And then there is one other component of degree 2 over each line. This guy, so let me say what this is, GI is uh, the, the translate of the theta divisor by the point of order 2. So it's really a copy of C. Twiddle sitting inside the Jacobian, uh, and it covers 2 to 1, the line. And you see it, it has multiplicity 4, right? So this has multiplicity 2, and this has multiplicity 2. So uh, this is what the parabolic divisor is. So we are again in the same situation we were on the curve. The parabolic divisor is not reduced. So in order to specify a parabolic structure, you need to choose a partition. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, again, by doing the specialization from the generic, uh, generic symplectic leaf to the neopotent one, you can argue that the uh, relevant partition of this parabolic C twiddle is as EI plus EI plus GI. So 
when you specialize from the generic leaf, this reducible curve actually becomes irreducible. So there are two parabolic degrees that you have to specify, one on this curve and one on this curve. So uh, uh, um, F dot will have to be the push forward of some line bundle. And I'm going to take the line bundle to be the Fourier Mukai transform of A uh, with uh, coefficients, one coefficient on E and another coefficient on E plus. And again, when you write what this, what this means as being parabolic, it means that we are taking a floor of this guy plus the level and a floor of this guy plus the level. So now our question is, can we find these numbers, E and D, that describe the line bundle, so that the, uh, the push forward is stable? And of course, phi is the push forward of the one form the tautological one form. Uh, so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't explain this, but let me say it here. Alpha is the tautological one form. On the total space of the cotangent bundle of X with log poles in the lobby, lobby vocals. So it turns out that the blow up at the 16 points not only resolves the map from Y to X, but also resolves the map from the Higgs moduli space to the cotangent bundle of X. Only uh, it doesn't land in the cotangent bundle, it lands in the logarithmic cotangent bundle, as you expect, because you expect same parabolic structure along these guys. Uh, so it turns out that Y maps naturally to the total space of the logarithmic cotangent bundle of X. And that map is alpha. So it gives you a section in the pullback of the logarithmic cotangent. So, so, in fact, you can analyze this picture completely. What's happening is that... <clears throat> so this map, it's actually a, a, a birational map. It's not an isomorphism. You know, typically, when you have a spectral cover, uh, it sits as a sub-variety in the coefficient bundle. In this case, what happens with the spectral cover is that it's not a sub-variety, it maps to the coefficient bundle. And the map actually uh, is birational and finite. It actually glues some points. So what's happening is that if you look at the covering space from Y to X, so X is this uh, uh, um, the Opezzo surface, and in it we have the lines. So you have, if you have two lines that intersect, over each such line in Y, you have a copy of EI twice, and a curve, which is GI, which co covers 2 to 1, and a copy of EJ twice, and a curve, which covers 2 to 1. So this is EJ and GJ. And they meet in this pattern. So the EJ meets the GI, doesn't meet the EI. The EIs are blow up at, at diff distinct points, so they cannot meet. And uh, uh, the GJ uh, means the EI. So this is the fiber. Uh, this is the fiber over this point. And what this map alpha does when you map it to the logarithmic cotangent bundle is it glues these two points. So there are 32 points in Y that get glued in pair. I mean, not 32, 96, whatever, points in Y. They sit over the intersection points of all the lines that, that get glued in pairs. Anyway, so there is this alpha, and you push it forward. So the only thing you really need to do is find these numbers, E and D, and, of course, the numbers that would define the parabolic structure on the Hecke kernel. 
uh, so that uh, the Hecke condition is satisfied and the, 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 the Mochizuki conditions are satisfied. So you want the bundle to be, the Higgs bundle to be stable and you want the first and the second parabolic Chern class to be zero. Uh, the stability is not an issue because this cover is irreducible. So the push forward of a line bundle from an irreducible guy is automatically stable. There are no sub sheaves that you can use to destroy stability. But the parabolic chunk class conditions are actually very stringent, especially the second parabolic chunk class condition because it's quadratic. The first one is affine linear, but the second one is quadratic. <clears throat> so here is our question now reformulated. Um, choose E and D so that uh, the first parabolic chain class of the push forward is zero, the second parabolic chain class of the push forward is zero, and for all A, uh, the, the Hecke condition holds. And the one thing I didn't specify here is I didn't specify the Hecke kernel. The Hecke kernel also has a bunch of numerical coefficients in it. Uh, so this assumes we have chosen a Hecke kernel. So the Hecke kernel, remember, it's given by, it's a line bundle, parabolic line bundle on H. We know what the parabolic divisor is. And in fact, the, uh, um, when you normalize it so that the coefficient is zero, there is only one line bundle of degree zero on H because H is rational. Uh, it's the blow up of uh, a rational variety. So there is only the trivial line bundle. So this guy is just O, and then there will be some coefficients multiplying the divisors that we have. So we have LP, LQ, LLC, R1, and R2. So there are, again, 58 coefficients that we need to choose. Choose them once and for all, so that for, and choose E and D, so that for all possible A's, this, uh, um, this transformation uh, holds. This equation on the, on the pullback push forward holds. OK, so now we are really uh, 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 in a uh, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, in a situation where we can write down equations. Um, <clears throat> So the Hecke condition so, so there is one variable in the in the Hecke equation which is the choice of the point in the Jacobian, the choice of the line bundle A that determined the abelianization of, of E theta. Uh, but I I converted that to a choice on the, on the Jacobian by, by, by Fourier Mukai, so this thing is not free to move. It depends on A. This is the Fourier Mukai of A. So, <coughs> so the Hecke condition is a condition on a two dimensional family. the family corresponding to A. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, but uh, in fact, the dependence on A peels off. So the, this is the first remark. Uh, when you write the Hecke condition, if you choose the uh, the 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 <clears throat> the line bundle de determining f dot to be the Fourier Mukai of A, uh, then the Hecke condition for any A is the same as the Hecke condition for A equals O. So the Hecke condition is in two-dimensional family, but the dependence of A decouples. And it becomes equivalent To the Hecke condition for A equals O, the trivial line bundle. So the dependence on the line bundle just fails off uh, by, by, by a seesaw principle, by a pull push, uh, because you know how the, the line bundle and its Fourier Mukai are related. Uh, so, so, so if you do that, you see that there is no dependence on A. So it now really becomes a statement about, uh, about parabolic line bundles uh, on, on the curve C Tweedle, parabolic line bundles on the modular spectral cover Y, and a transform between them, a parabolic line bundle on H, and a transform between them which uses pullbacks and push forwards of Higgs bundles. But of course, there are unknowns. The unknowns are these coefficients and the coefficients E and D. But if you are able to compute the pullbacks, the push forwards, the tensor product, then at the end, the Hecke condition just becomes a system of equations on those numbers. Systems actually, system actually have polynomial equations. Most of them are affine linear, and there are some quadratic ones. And then you need to show that that system has a solution. Yeah. Real numbers, in fact, rational. So at the end, they'll, they'll all, all be rational. <coughs> and um, yeah, so this was, uh, uh, yeah. you know, you, you have no choice. This is, these are parabolic weights, right? So this, they, they are real numbers. <coughs> uh, and um, so on the on the D-module side, this just means that the the, the residues are minus those real numbers. The eigenvalues of the residues are minus those real numbers. So, I mean the, the eigenvalues of the, I mean the twisting of the D module are minus those real numbers. So I've specialized to that particular case. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so now you, you are facing a question of how to compute the actual Hecke operator on these guys. This will give equations on E, D, L, P, L, Q, L, L, C, R1 and R2. By the way, the A and the B that I use to abelianize uh, uh, the, the, the eigenvalue, they're not really parameters. I mean, you can use them as parameters, but they're not because they depend on the parabolic weights of my original moduli problem. So those you can fix. <laughs> they just need to satisfy that equation that I, I wrote, uh, sum is three. Uh, so we'll give equations if we can compute the pullback by, uh, uh, by P, by P1, by P2, the tensor product, and the push forward by Q star in the world of parabolic Higgs bundles. But you know, this is not just defining those operations. They have to be defined in such a way that they uh, 
correspond under the non abelian Koch correspondence to the usual operations for D modules. So we want to have notions of a pullback, tensor product, and push forward of parabolic Higgs bundles that have the property that when you convert those Higgs bundles by the non abelian Koch correspondence to flat bundles, and you perform pullbacks, push forwards, or tensor products of D modules, flat bundles as D modules, then you get the same answer by the non-abelian Hodge correspondence. So you need to solve this problem. And once you solve it, then you need to compute. Okay, so let me talk about this. Okay, so, uh, so this is a so digression. Which need to define uh, pullbacks, push forwards, and tensor products of parabolic tame Higgs bundles with vanishing chunk classes. such that um, uh, under the non-abelian Hodge correspondence on X with the parabolic structure on X, uh, they correspond to pullbacks Push forward of tensor products of D modules. Or in this case, because we are dealing with irreducible objects, you can apply the extension theorem and say that they correspond to pullbacks, push forwards, and tensor products of twister D modules. <coughs> so in fact, you know, you know, formulated like that, it seems like a vacuous question because the category of twister D modules has all six operations. So you can just define uh, the pullback, the push forward, or the, uh, or the tensor product by saying, OK, take the Higgs bundle, write its twister deformation to a twister D module, then perform pullback, push forward, or whatever of the twister D module, and then specialize back to zero. So that's a perfectly well-defined operation, which is completely universal, and has this property. The problem is that it's very hard to compute. So what you really want, when I say I need to define, I mean, I don't really need to define it. I need to give you a way of computing these guys entirely in the world of Higgs bundles, and preferably completely algebraically, without solving differential equations, without going to twist to the modules, without pushing those down and specializing. And so this is something that we <clears throat> did with, with uh, Ron and Carl Simpson in a particularly, in some somewhat restricted context, which is enough for the calculation we want to do. Uh, so with uh, Ron and Simpson, we uh, gave a formula an algebraic formula for these operations in terms of Higgs bundles. And in fact, uh, uh, Tucker also proved that formula in a much better way, uh, in, a, in a slightly bigger generality. Uh, Also, much is okay. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to explain this formula tomorrow and uh, tell you how it actually helps you to derive these equations. 
but you really need this formula because otherwise you can't do the calculation. Or at least I don't know how to do the calculation. Uh, so I think this is a good place to stop. Questions? Say it again. What does Kubak push for tensor product mean in <clears throat> You know this. Um, uh, You mean in the Foucault category of cotangent bundles? Yeah, I mean, there are these standard Lagrangian correspondences that correspond to maps. So if you have a map between two spaces, it gives you a correspondence between the two cotangent bundles, or so Lagrangian correspondence between the two cotangent bundles. And so you can apply the, the, the uh, use that correspondence as a kernel of an integral transform, uh, either from the left to the right or from the right to the left. So these are, and apply to D modules. So this, this Lagrangian correspondence actually gives you a map between the two Foucault categories, uh, one way or the other. So these are the pullbacks and the push forwards, and the tensor product is the, the obvious one. <coughs> yeah, I mean, you know, question, the question for the Foucault category wouldn't make sense unless you're specifying that it's for cotangent bundles and it's coming from the map of the underlying spaces. The questions? Yeah, I'll make a comment since there are no questions, which is that I was hoping to do also the other example of the genus 2 curve, uh, because, so I, I showed you two of the subtleties that are happening here. One is that you have to deal with parabolic structures for non-reduced divisors, and the other is that you need this algebraic formula in order to actually do the calculation. So these two subtleties are actually persisting everywhere in, in all examples that you can try to do. But uh, when you look at the genus 2 case, there is another subtlety, and I won't be able to talk about it tomorrow because I, I won't have enough time. Uh, and the other subtlety is that uh, what happens in that case is that the wobbly divisors are not normal crossings. So you need to find a way to resolve them. And it turns out that there are natural resolutions, but the natural resolutions are not by blow-ups, but are by stackiness. Uh, which is as good for, for, for these purposes as anything. Okay, but I won't be able to talk about that. <laughs> Let's thank Tony again.